Every day when I wake up in the morning, I see the sky. I think about the things that you've made, all the beauty and your glory is showing. Yeah. It never bores me to look at the ocean. The waves are crashing, the water spraying up in my face. I look above and all the seagulls are soaring. Yeah. We've got to overcome the darkness so we don't get caught in the middle. Between the hopeful and the heartless So Hello, good day, good morning I just can't stop smiling Because today is a brand new day And all the darkness and the pain Is just fading behind me Oh Lord, what a beautiful day All the planets surround me The way they orbit just boggles my mind The way the sun keeps on shining, yeah We've got to overcome the darkness So we don't get caught in the middle Between the hopeful and the heartless So, hello, good day, good morning I just can't stop smiling Cause today is a brand new day And all the darkness and the pain is just fading behind me Oh Lord, what a beautiful day There's nothing to fear, it'll be okay It's the day that the Lord has made day that the Lord has made. There's nothing to fear, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. It's the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has it's made. The day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. So, hello, good day, good morning. I just can't stop smiling. Cause the day is a brand new day. And all the darkness and the pain is just fading behind me. Oh Lord, what a beautiful day Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Live with Doug. We are thinking through God's word together. Glad you could all be with us. Oh man, how cool is that to see uh, we got two guys from Canada on here, one guy from the UK, at least one. Now, Ron, uh, or Gerda Dendeka, <laughs> is that, uh, um, are you in Canada as well? I'm trying to remember. You guys may be ganging up on us. How great is that? Good morning, Caitlin. I uh, saw a couple comments there about the music. Uh, yeah, we're thrilled. That's my son. If you haven't heard, you can find his music. Gabe Gooden is his name. And we've got way more music in the pipeline. Just uh, life has been kind of busy, but we'll get more stuff out. But we'd love to hear your thoughts on the rest of the album. All right, so uh, we are in the book of Hebrews. And we're in this section in chapter 8 where the writer is really walking through what I like to call the glory of the new covenant. Now, I have spent the better part of the last 20 years, or at least a significant part, of the last 20 years, trying to convince my covenant theology brothers and sisters and dispensational theology brothers and sisters that a significant part of what they believe is just not derived from the scripture, but from presuppositions brought to the scripture. And for both of those systems, the the hinge upon which their doors uh, door swings is the continuity of the old covenant now they frame it differently covenant theology talks about the old covenant administration giving way to the new covenant administration of the covenant of grace but they see continuity there the dispensational group sees that Israel 
is still under the old covenant, but there's been this pause in God's work with Israel that eventually he's going to resume. It sure seems to me like Hebrews 8, 13, and this whole section really here in chapter 8, destroys both of those perspectives. Let me remind you again of what Hebrews 8, 13 says. When God said a new covenant, whenever he made that statement, he made the first covenant obsolete. And whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. Well, we emphasized this at length a couple days ago. When did God say a new covenant? Let me ask you. I know some of you are with us. When did God make that statement? Because the argument the author is making is whenever God said that, That started the countdown for the end of the Old Covenant. Whenever he said that, the Old Covenant was obsolete, meaning it wasn't gone yet. Remember we talked about cassette players? (laughs) We talked, or cassettes, we talked about CDs. When they become obsolete, like our, our, well, this could open all kinds of cans of worms. Our um, gas-powered vehicles may be obsolete, if the uh, the left and the, the climate alarmists have their way, then our gas-powered uh, cars are obsolete. They're still going to be around a while, but they're on their way out. Their days are numbered, according to that view, right? Yeah, so several of, you, several of you have this. God said a new covenant in Jeremiah's day, six centuries, that is 600 years before the coming of Christ in the new covenant. Whenever God said that, 6th century BC, the old covenant was obsolete, ready to disappear. Guess what? It disappeared. It's done. It's over. Because Jesus came and ended it and started the new covenant. And I say, praise the Lord. It's not good news for the Jews. It's Listen to this. If you've never thought this through, it is not good news for the Jews for them to still be under that covenant, which the Apostle Paul calls a ministry of death, a ministry of condemnation. We looked at the promises of that old covenant yesterday, promises to destroy them if they disobeyed. It's good news. For the Jew, that that covenant is over. And now everyone in the world, Jew or Gentile, has the opportunity, the invitation to put their trust in Jesus and be forgiven of their sins. That's really good news. And the writer of Hebrews here is going to show this distinction between that old covenant and the much better new covenant. So back to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6. But now he, that is Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry. And I drew your attention to this yesterday. Let me say it again. This more excellent, the Greek word emphasizes difference. But usually the difference means something that's different and better. So that's why our translators here uh, say more excellent. So He's obtained a different ministry from the old covenant priests. That's the context. And this word ministry, remember, is uh, liturgia, which is the, um, we get our word liturgy from it, although that's not exactly a a wonderful transliteration or interpretation. Anyway, uh, this ministry is, is sort of temple ministry, priestly ministry. Jesus has obtained a different and better temple type ministry by as much as he is the mediator of a better covenant. Not a better administration of the covenant of grace. There is no covenant of grace anywhere in the scripture. At least that term is not mentioned. It's a better covenant. It's a different covenant. It's a new covenant. It is not the old covenant. And it's dramatically better, exponentially better. It's been enacted on better 
promise it. Now, I made uh, a little bit of a mention of this word yesterday. Let me just come back to it. This word enacted uh, would be a term that we might, uh, we, we could translate it legislated kind of thing. It has the word law in it in the original uh, to, to put the law in place. This new covenant was legally given, if you will, on better promises. And it's the same, same term he used in chapter 7 uh, when he was talking about uh, when there's a, a new priesthood, there's also a changing of the law, that kind of thing. And the people received the law based on the priesthood. That, that word received there is, is a form of the same word. So there's now this new legal relationship mediated by Christ, this covenant, which is legalized on better promises. Now, I know some, some people don't like to even use the word legal law at all in the new covenant, but that is the term he's used here. And he, he's not trying to emphasize a law in quite the same way as the old covenant, like the Ten Commandments. It's just, it's a, for a Jew, remember that's the original audience, the Hebrew audience, for a Jew, that would have meant something. I think it's almost a play on words here. This new legalized structure is based on better promises in this new covenant because it's a covenant that brings forgiveness. Let's, let's get into it. For, he says, if the first covenant, that covenant God made with Israel, if it had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. So something was wrong with that first covenant. Now, again, people get all bent out of shape sometimes with that statement. And it's true here in verse 8, he says, finding fault with them. The, the covenant itself was not the problem. The fault was with the people. Now, we can make too much of that, I think. But the bottom line is the old covenant could not bring righteousness to the Jew because they couldn't keep it. So that was the fault of the first covenant. Uh, it, they didn't, it didn't give the power. It didn't give the people the ability to obey. And so God sought for a second covenant. And he announced it six centuries before the coming of Christ. Here's what he says. So he found fault with them, with the people of Israel. And he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers. Now, which covenant is this? Well, it's on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. That is the old covenant, what we call the old covenant. That is the covenant with Moses. That is the covenant with Israel through Moses. This is the covenant that has at the heart of it the Ten Commandments. It's the Sinai covenant. What, any of those terms you want to use is fine. This is not the Abrahamic covenant. This is not the Davidic covenant. This is not the covenant of grace. It's the covenant God made with Israel when he led them out of Egypt. I don't know how he could make this any plainer. We must not let our theology distort what is here. There is a new covenant that Jesus is the mediator of that is not like the covenant God made with Israel when he took them out of Egypt. And again, I want to emphasize, I think this destroys both covenant theology and dispensational theology. He doesn't say the administration is not like the other. He says the covenant is not like the other. All right, I'm not going to go down that path. I don't think I've got a lot of covenant theologians here. I'm likely, based on my title, to get some, uh, some dispensational uh, trolls here in the next day or two. We'll see. That'll be fun. Anyway, so, here's, so he led them out of Egypt. He made a covenant with them, and he's making a new one now that's not like that one. And notice the explanation, for they did not continue in my covenant. Remember the terms of that covenant? 
I will bless you in every way possible, God said, if you obey and keep all my statutes, all my commands of this covenant. Did they do it? Did they obey? No. For they did not continue in my covenant. And what was God's posture toward them? He says, and I did not care for them. Now, this is the Septuagint he's quoting here. In the, in the Hebrew, uh, I believe he says something. Let me just go look at it real quick. It's a little bit different. There's nothing substantially different, but it's a little bit different in the Hebrew, which uh, is what we have in our translations of the Old Testament. And notice he, uh, he changes the, uh, the wording here just a, a little bit. He says, my covenant, which they broke. See that here? They broke my covenant. Although I was a husband to them. And you, you can see what God meant by that, right? I, I, it's like a husband entering into a covenant with his wife, right? A marriage covenant. And then she went off and committed adultery, which breaks the covenant. Somewhat, I don't know if, uh, if she will follow me here, uh, watch this or not, but um, uh, there's a woman who took issue with something I said in, a, in another video about m the marriage covenant. And uh, I just want to reiterate, it sure seems to me like the, the New Testament says adultery severs that covenant. doesn't mean the marriage has to be over, but that's the imagery used throughout the Old Testament and the New, it, it seems to me. That's, that's what God is saying here. I was a husband to them, but they broke my covenant. They committed adultery. And so he says, I didn't care for them. It's a strong word. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. This is the new covenant. This is what I will do in 600 years, even though they didn't know the time frame. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts. They won't merely be on tablets of stone or written down in a book or in a scroll. Right? My requirements will be placed in their minds and their hearts. I'm going to change the way they think and the way they desire so that they will want to obey me. Remember, the Jews could not keep the covenant. They did not obey. They committed idolatry and broke the law repeatedly. God says in this new covenant, I'm going to put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. This is very similar to Ezekiel 36 where God says, I'm going to take out that old heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. I'm going to put my spirit in you so that you will want to please me. That's one of the gifts of the new covenant. We have the spirit and the spirit transforms us. He gives us new birth. We are alive to the things of God. We want to please him. God said beforehand, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to change them on the inside. How many times in the law and the prophets did God say to Israel, you have circumcised foreskins. You need circumcised hearts. You have this external mark in your body, but your heart is not changed. Your will, your desire, your thinking, your passions, those things are not changed. That's what you need. Well, that's one of the gifts of the new covenant. If you are a Christian, God has changed your insides, <laughs> your inner man. He's changed your thoughts and your feelings and passions and emotions and desires and choices to want to do what he wants you to do. It's one of the gifts of the new covenant. That's why when you see people who live in debauchery and sin, and claim to be Christians, it's, it's why you know they're not legitimately Christians because no, the new covenant says, I'm going to change my people on the inside. I will be their God. They shall be my people. And then he makes this distinction. This is very important theologically and biblically. And they shall not teach everyone, his fellow citizen, and everyone his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. Now, I'm going to try not to make this too muddy for you, but again, I, I keep coming back to covenant theology because 
while I have spent a lot of time wrestling with covenant theology, I went to covenant theological seminary and so on. They love to use the term covenant community. They describe the church as the covenant community. And because they see the church and Israel as essentially the same, uh, they, they use this terminology that, that they're, the covenant community of Israel was the whole nation of Israel, and there were some genuine believers in that community and some uh, non-believers in that community. And they would say the church is the same, and the covenant community uh, has genuine believers and non-believers. And the thing that marks you in the community is the signs. So in the old covenant was circumcision, and the new covenant is baptism. That's why they baptize babies. The, the, the proper view of this, we should not call the church covenant community as though it's parallel to Israel. Let me see if I can illustrate this uh, for you. If you're listening to this, sorry, you, you can't see my, my doodling uh, on, the, on the screen here, but I'll try to describe it. So think of the, uh, the old covenant and the new covenant, and I've drawn two circles, and the circle above represents the old covenant, the circle below represents the new covenant. So let's talk about the old covenant first. The old covenant, the Jews, Israel, whatever term you want to mean, but uh, you want to, want to use. But the old covenant was exclusive to the nation of Israel, right? Everybody gets that. God did not make this covenant with the Philistines or the Amorites or the Canaanites or anybody else. He didn't make it with America or Canada or UK. He made the old covenant with Israel, right? How did you get in the old covenant? You were born into it. Let that sink in. If you were born to a Jewish family, and if you were a boy, you were circumcised on the eighth day, you are a Jew. And you are bound to the terms of that old covenant. You follow me? A child is born. Right? A child is born to Joshua. That boy, circumcised on the eighth day, Joshua's son, is bound to all of those blessings and curses that we talked about in Deuteronomy 28. From the, from the day he's born, or at least from the day he's circumcised, he is bound to that covenant. He didn't opt into it. Do you see that? Joshua's son, I'm just picking Joshua randomly. Uh, Joshua's son did not say, hey, I want to become a Jew. I want to be under this covenant. I want to be bound to those terms so that if I obey God, he'll bless me. If I disobey, he'll curse me. Joshua's son did not opt in. He was born into that covenant. He did not know God unless he was taught about God. So if Joshua did not teach his son about God and the covenant and the terms and the threat of disobedience, that boy would grow up in the covenant, bound to that contract and unaware of God and the judgment that he would bring upon himself and his people if he committed idolatry, for instance. Why did the Jews continue to disobey and incur the wrath of God? Because they didn't teach their kids. Do you remember uh, the Shema passage? And, and we grab this all the time and just sort of rip it out of context. But when it says uh, in Deuteronomy 6 there, teach your children when they're standing up and lying down and walking along the way and here and there and everywhere, basically, always be teaching your children. That's not just good parenting advice. It is crucial. Moses is, is emphatic. You must teach your children. Otherwise, they're going to sin against God and bring the curses of the covenant. And Israel repeatedly failed to teach their children the terms of the covenant. They didn't know the Lord. The vast majority of Israelites for many generations did not know the Lord. Do you remember King Josiah when he finds the covenant, the law, centuries after Moses? They found this scroll with the law. They hadn't, for who knows how long, hadn't 
been aware of this covenant law that God made with Israel. And Josiah reads it and he rips his robe and says, oh no, no wonder we're under all of this hostility and persecution and defeat. Here were the terms of the covenant that we have ignored for for generations. Jews did not know the Lord unless they were taught about the Lord. What about the new covenant? The new covenant is the covenant God makes with Christians. You don't get in by birth, you get in by faith. Children are not Christians because they're baptized. You should not baptize babies. You don't get into this new covenant by virtue of birth or baptism or anything else. You get in by faith. You must know God to be in the new covenant because you can't have faith in someone you don't know of. You don't need to be taught, know the Lord, if you are in the new covenant. Because for you to be in the new covenant presupposes you know the Lord. You can't get in without knowing the Lord. It's a prerequisite. Do you see that drastic difference? So this promise that God makes about the coming new covenant, they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. Even the least in this new covenant, whatever that means. (laughs) Do you want to sign up for being the least? At this point, it's irrelevant what that means. It doesn't matter who you are. If you are in the new covenant, no one has to teach you, know the Lord. Because if you are actually in the covenant, you already know the Lord. You can't get in otherwise. Do you see how drastically not like the old covenant, the new covenant is? And frankly, our covenant brothers distort this and diminish the significance of this with their view of the covenant community and baptizing babies and all of that. It's serious. It's a problem. All right, time is about up. I see a couple of comments here. Let me, uh, let me take a look. Peter says, a covenant is a legally binding agreement. Agreed. Uh, Lon says, I don't understand what you mean by the administration of the old covenant, et cetera, and differentiating. Uh, that would take a long time. Um, basically, in a nutshell, uh, covenant theology believes that God made a covenant with Adam called the covenant of grace and that that covenant flows from the Garden of Eden all the way to the end and that the covenant with Israel is not essentially different from the new covenant. And I mean essentially in the, in the strict sense at its essence because it's not an old covenant, new covenant. It's old covenant administration of this one covenant of grace. I know I'm just repeating what I said earlier. It, um, if you watch my series, The Glory of the New Covenant, I walk through all of this. It's a very complex theological system they've put together. And uh, if you want to learn more about it, maybe watch that series um, or read uh, Abraham's Four Seeds by John Riesinger. Uh, but that's, that's the heart of it. And that's why covenant theology is... Um, well, uh, yeah, it, that's why we, we differ on what, uh, what they say. Rob says, covenant theology works on the premise of one covenant with different administrations. Yeah, exactly. And uh, again, I think Hebrews 8 says that's impossible biblically. So for us, glory, rejoice, be thankful to be in the new covenant it's so much better you know the lord he has given his spirit to transform you so that now you want to obey him and as we saw yesterday we'll look at again and our sins are forgiven in every way the new covenant is superior to the old covenant think on that have a great day we'll come back tomorrow and continue this conversation Take care.